Hello, I'm Lucy Mailing and I'm an ST7 in trauma and orthopaedics. Flexosheath infection. What is flexosheath infection? It's also known as pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis. And it's an orthopaedic emergency, but one that can be easily overlooked. And I'll explain why. Flexor sheath infection describes the presence of pus within the flexor tendon sheaths in the hand. But what are the sheaths? They are synovium lined fibrous tunnels, which serve to protect and nourish the flexor tendons within, as well as keeping them close to the bone to avoid bow stringing on movement. Like in synovial joints, the sheaths contain a small amount of synovial fluid which helps the tendon to glide freely and also allows diffusion of nutrients to the tendon. All flexor tendons live within a sheath, unlike the extensors. Hence, we do not see pyogenic extensor tenosynovitis. As you can see in this diagram, the sheaths in the middle three digits extend from the MCP joints to the distal phalanx. The origin of the lumbrical muscles stops the sheath from extending any further, more proximal into the hand. On the border digits though, the thumb and the little, there is a radial and an ulna bursa respectively. And these communicate with the sheath and travel proximally to the wrist. I'll come back to that later. So how does infection get in there? Most commonly, it is via direct inoculation from trauma. Anecdotally, I often find this to happen in gardeners. It can also spread from nearby soft tissue infection or rarely by the hematogenous route. So what happens when infection gets in? If you've already seen my talk on septic arthritis, you will know that synovial joints are immunologically privileged, which means that immune cells are excluded from here. Similarly, they aren't present in the sheath either. So if bugs get in, the body is unlikely to be able to clear the infection by itself. Infection in here is a problem for a number of reasons. Number one, Bacteria produce toxins which damage the flexor tendons directly. And number two, replacement of synovial fluid with pus means the tendons are starved of their nourishment. And again, there is cell necrosis and damage to the tendons. The flexor tendon sheaths are fibrous and non-expansile, and they're almost completely occupied by the tendons with only a tiny space left for any fluid. So even with just a few millilitres of pus, the pressure within the sheath is raised and almost like a mini compartment syndrome, the vasculature to the tendons becomes compromised. How do I diagnose it? Because this is an orthopaedic emergency, I see this patient as a priority and I aim to make a prompt diagnosis. The diagnosis can be made clinically with the presence of these four signs. Cannavel signs. Number one, there will be pain on passive extension of the finger. Remember, it is always the flexor side affected. Number two, fusiform swelling or sausage finger. Number three, the affected finger will be held in partial flexion as this detensions the sheath and is a position of relative comfort. And number four, tenderness along the course of the flexor tendon sheath. All four of these can be assessed within just seconds. And I remember two things to see and two things to do. The two things to see are a sausage finger, which is held in partial flexion. The two things to do are to palpate for tenderness along the sheath, and to elicit pain on passive extension. The 
presence of all four signs is diagnostic of flexor sheath infection and the absence of any excludes it. The presence of some, but not all, may indicate the earlier stages of infection or indeed a differential diagnosis, such as a septic joint or a subcutaneous collection. Usually with infection, one can expect raised inflammatory markers and white cell counts. But in FSI, blood markers may be almost normal, so don't be reassured by these. Typically, the CRP can be less than 10. So how on earth can this be an emergency when the bloods are, so, bloods are so unremarkable? And the reason is that this is a limb, or rather a digit threatening, but not a life-threatening emergency. The sheaths are so small that only one or two mils of pus can fit in there. So this isn't likely to elicit much of a systemic inflammatory response. What is a horseshoe abscess? Remember earlier I said that most sheaths terminate at the MCP joint, so you wouldn't expect to see infection traveling more proximal or in more than one digit, unless of course both had had a direct inoculation. The border digits are different. They are in communication with each other via bursae, which travel all the way to the wrist and back up. So if you have an infection of the thumb or the little finger, this can pass all the way around and back to the other side in a so-called horseshoe abscess. How do I treat it? I commence high dose intravenous antibiotics following my local trust protocol. And if in doubt, I discuss with my consultant microbiologist. Because antibiotics struggle to reach the target area within the sheath, the mainstay of treatment is surgical. As with any infection, we need to drain the pus. The image on the left shows the preferred first line method of doing so. And this is a rather elegant method with minimal surgical trauma. Firstly, a small transverse incision is made at the palm in the level of the A1 pulley around the MCP joint on the volar side. One can dissect down onto the flexor sheath and make a small longitudinal incision within it, revealing but not injuring the underlying tendon. If there is infection, a small amount of pus will drain out and this can be sent to the lab for microscopy, culture and sensitivities. It can be underwhelming how little fluid does drain. It's not like a big juicy abscess because only a couple of mils of pus is in there. A second incision is then made over the A5 pulley at, or at the distal end of the sheath. This picture shows a lateral cut but I make a transverse volar incision at the level of the DIP joint crease. Again, dissect down and open the sheath. A cannula with the needle retracted to avoid sharp injury, or a pediatric feeding tube can be inserted into the proximal hole and directed distally. One can then flush this with normal saline and it will drain like a little fountain out of the distal hole. This washes the whole length of the sheath without having to open it up. Note that we wash from proximal to distal to avoid pushing infection further up into the hand. The right hand image shows the traditional way of accessing the whole finger using zigzag or Brunner incisions. Following trauma, including surgery, the finger will always try to scar up. Scars passing perpendicular to joints can lead to contracture, which is why we do these zigzag shaped ones to reduce that risk. Through these cuts, one can carefully dissect down and open the entire flexor sheath. Beware that this method will lead to much more scarring in the deep tissues, which can lead to stiffness and even defunctioning of the finger. The 
Bruner method is therefore reserved for severe cases where the infection has already caused adhesions, making it impossible to pass a cannula. Or in a repeat washout, if the percutaneous method has failed to improve the clinical picture. A horseshoe abscess will require a proximal incision as well to drain pus from the wrist and hand areas. After surgery, the wounds should ideally be left open and closed 24 to 48 hours later after a second look. Some would recommend leaving the cannula in situ with continuous saline irrigation, but personally, the retention of a foreign body here worries me, so I prefer to take it out. It is essential to elevate the arm using a Bradford sling, to continue antibiotics, and to commence hand therapy early. This is to maintain the range of movement in the digit. What are the consequences of FSI? By far the commonest is stiffness, particularly if there has been a delay to treatment. Tendon rupture can occur secondary to the processes mentioned earlier as the tendon is starved of its nutrition. Of course, infection can also spread to other surrounding tissues. Similar to the British Orthopaedic Association Standards for Trauma, or BOASTS, the British Society for Surgery of the Hand has published guidance on a number of important hand conditions, including this one. You'll easily find this online to help you when you see your next patient with this condition. To conclude, this is a clinical emergency. Remember the Cannavel signs, which include two things to see and two things to do. And treatment begins with antibiotics, but for the majority of patients, the main treatment is surgical. Thank you.